Welcome to Engage 360, Denver Seminary's podcast. Join us as we explore the redemptive power of the gospel and the life-changing truth of scripture at work in our culture today. Hi, friends. Welcome to Engage 360. This is Denver Seminary's podcast. We're glad you've joined us for today's conversation. Uh, My name is Don Payne. I'll be your host for this episode. Over recent years, uh, forms of ministry have become increasingly specialized, which is a great thing because it allows the gospel to impact people and impact society in even more nuanced and personalized ways. Seminary degree programs these days are more creative and specialized than ever, and increasing numbers of people who attend seminary do not envision traditional pastoral or preaching roles. However, that trend towards specialization must never be allowed to eclipse the importance of the traditional ministry of preaching. And Denver Seminary has a long and exemplary emphasis on preaching, which really we're very grateful for. We we still think that that's a central task in Christian ministry, because without faithful proclamation of the Word, and by the Word I mean both the Gospel and the Scriptures, without that faithful proclamation of the Word, all other ministries are left without a gravitational center. And we have upcoming this summer, 2024, the next installment of the Shannon Preaching Lectureship and Seminar, which is going to feature our guests in this episode. Uh, First of all, author and Old Testament scholar, Dr. Wendy Wibber, uh, Dr. Scott Wenig, who serves as the Professor of Applied Theology and the Haddon W. Robinson Chair of Biblical Preaching, Uh, Reverend David Ward, who is currently pursuing doctoral studies in preaching and will be directing a Lilly Foundation-funded grant called the Compelling Preaching Initiative here at Denver Seminary. And then Dr. Matt Wolf, who is the lead pastor of Arise Church here in Denver and also an adjunct faculty member with us in homiletics here at Denver Seminary. So I want to welcome each of you, um, Wendy, Matt, Dave, Scott. Good to see you all. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Doctor? Good to see you All right, get us started, Um, one or more of you. How how would you assess the state of preaching in the church today? How does it tend to be viewed and valued, and why? What are strengths, weaknesses, trends, all of that? Where are we today with preaching? Well, I'm going to kick this off, and uh, I'm going to refer to uh, a uh, Pew study that was done about four or five years ago. So this is This is a Pew Endowment study, and they came to the conclusion after surveying hundreds and hundreds of people that the single most important thing in the reason people choose to attend or not attend a church was because of the quality of preaching in that church. So I think from a layperson's perspective, uh, not just the professional or the preacher's perspective, but the layperson's perspective, preaching is hugely, hugely important. Now, we're in the tradition of Protestantism, in the tradition of the Reformation. I realize there are other traditions. I get that because I'm a church historian. But for our tradition as Protestant evangelical Christians, preaching is preeminent. I know that doesn't sit well with somebody, but the statistics seem to bear that out. People go to church because of the preaching. So I'll be quiet and let Matt and Dave weigh in since they're better preachers than I am. (laughs) Well, I don't know if that's true. Um, you know, I know last fall, uh, Angie, my wife and I went to hear, uh, Jerry Seinfeld at the Belco theater in downtown Denver, uh, where 5,000 people packed out that auditorium to hear this guy, Jerry Seinfeld, talk to us for over an hour using only a microphone and a spotlight. And we were enraptured by everything he said, because we were there to, to laugh and he made us laugh a lot. But I was thinking about that later and I realized, you know, he, he's a almost 70 year old, uh, Caucasian, uh, Jewish American. And, uh, the audience was very diverse. And so I thought, you know, the format is not the problem. If we have uh, an issue of preaching, you know, one speaker speaking to an audience, uh, people were, were there for that, paid lots of money for that. Um, and you see that again and again, people listen to lectures, they'll listen to Ted talks, they'll, they'll listen to go to spoken word performances. Preaching as not as a format is not outdated in our culture. It's still relevant if, as long as people feel like there's something of value or something of importance, uh, that's being said from the stage, the platform, the front. 
It's just a question of, are we going to speak God's word and life changing truths to people or not? Yeah, I, I, I can com concur with those guys. Um, and w what I've just discovered, even just personally, that preaching still changes lives. And even this morning, got coffee with a guy. We had just taught a message a few weeks ago on debt and how you should get out of debt from the Bible. And he was telling me this morning how they've changed some of their financial decisions. So you see that preaching is leading to um, life change. And one cool thing is not only are people listening to TED Talks, but now with the technology we have and formats, preaching has a secondary life in podcasts. I mean, even right now we're doing this podcast and people are listening to a, a long form talking, right? And or in short clips on TikTok and Instagram. Um, and, and it just gives a second life to people. And a lot of people are listening to that even before they set foot in a church building. Like, so it gives our preaching more impact. I got an email yesterday from a guy that I've known now for a few months, hasn't been to church in years, but has been listening to me because somebody shared a message on Spotify with him. And so the fact that he's coming this Sunday for the first time, and he already has a relationship, has already heard preaching. So I just think preaching has had an even bigger impact than ever before. And we take a little clip from my message every single week, and we put it up online on Instagram, on TikTok. And I have one right. message it's a minute long message, but it's it as a 6 million, 6 million views. So if one person can hear 6 million, or, you know, my sermon, it was, it was definitely not good enough to be heard by 6 million people. So don't go check that out. But I, I just think it, it has a second life and it has even bigger impact today than maybe it ever has. Hmm. Wendy, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I think one of the great values of preaching in our culture, especially is that it assumes that there's a source of truth outside of ourselves. Yeah. And that just goes against the air we breathe. Mm. Um, there are so many voices more than ever speaking to us and challenging and even discounting truth. And if, if we stop preaching what we claim to be the truth, what we believe to be the truth, um, then we buy what the culture is selling. And, and we legitimize that it's okay to make your own truth claims. You get to write your own script. We hold to the truth of the Bible that it is a source of truth, and Jesus claims to be the truth. And we get at Jesus through the Bible, through preaching. Um, we don't get to make him in our own image and the, the truth that we want him to be. So I think that is just one of the really important things about preaching, is that it, it grounds people in what we believe to be true. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I... What a loop back to something Scott said at the outset, uh, which was the, the the centrality of the role of preaching in Protestantism, particularly in the, in Protestant evangelicalism. And at the same time, I can recall within the last twenty to thirty years, there were some movements, some fairly aggressive movements afoot within Protestant evangelicalism that were discounting or diminishing the role of preaching, uh, questioning the value of preaching. Now, that may have been a rather temporary uh, movement or, uh, or fad even, but, I, but I'm curious what led to that and what lingering effects do you see there might still be from some of that? Why, why, why do people question the value of preaching? I'm wondering how many of those churches are still around. <laughs> well, that's a fair question. <laughs> One of my senses of that is, is that... Uh, yeah, I remember when there was some prominence given to some of those movements back in the 80s and 90s. I think a lot of people felt like, well, I'm just getting all this content, but I'm not really engaging people in a relationship, and I'm not really getting to know people, and I don't even feel like I'm getting to know God better. So what we need to do is just circle up the chairs and share. And I wouldn't discount that. I mean, I think that that's part and parcel of being a Christian and getting to know people and having fellowship and relationship. Those are very, very important things. But I don't think that those can replace the centrality of the word, as Wendy just said, especially now in a culture where there's so much question about, does truth even exist? So I think it's even more important now than it, it was 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and I would say that there's a reality that preaching alone can't make a disciple or can't make disciple makers. Right. And so people take that reality and, and stretch it a little too far. But yes, there needs to be more than just preaching. But I don't think we should remove the thing that like 
Dr. Wenny pointed out, has the biggest impact. If 83% of their people pick which church they're going to go back to the next week based on their preaching, like you can't make a disciple if they're not there more than one week. So I think it should continue to be a part of the full discipleship package of what you do in your ministry or your church. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I really suspect that that, has, that was part of the the reason for the kickback against preaching is that perhaps there were some overdone expectations of, uh, or some perceptions of what preaching was expected to do. And, you know, as, as people began to realize that preaching cannot do everything, I uh, wonder if the pendulum swung because of that. Uh, are, so are we now experiencing the results of that pendulum swing the other direction and realizing if you do not have solid, reliable, sound preaching, uh, you really pay a big price for that. Well, I, I would also add this in. Uh, I, I'm a self-proclaimed white American baby boomer evangelical Christian. That's who I am. And I love preaching. But one of the things I've come to realize about our movement of evangelicalism is, and, and I mean this, this is both a strength and a weakness. It's a populist movement. In other words, it's of the people. And it's always been that way since the Great Awakenings of the 18th and 19th century. But here's the thing about evangelicalism that I've come to see that I think is kind of a downside to it is it's notoriously fadded. So what's the latest fad? What's the latest thing? Well, preaching is not a fad. I mean, preaching's got huge biblical and historical chops behind it. And once again, it's just part and parcel of the worship of God and learning who God is and what he wants for our lives. It's it's not a fad. So I don't think you can ever discount it, even though mm. sometimes in our movement, there's a tendency to discount certain things. I'd love to have uh, several of you reflect on trends that you have seen in preaching. How has, how has the role, the ministry of preaching changed in any way, for good or ill, uh, maybe over the long haul or even within the last few decades? Well, I can say, uh, you know, I studied preaching under uh, Scott, under Dr. Wenig, uh, I guess at the end of the, the first decade of the, the 2000s. And, you know, there was a big push, I think, because of Andy Stanley and his book, Communicating for Change, a lot more, you know, it was almost just talking. You know, we're talking together, even though I'm the main one talking as the preacher, but we're just going to talk. I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to preach at you. I'm just going to have a conversation. And I would say over the last, I don't know, six to eight years, there's been a much bigger push towards passion. Where is passion in the preaching? That if you're not passionate, um, then why are you even up there? It's a waste of time. And I think that's been a trend from my generation, a millennial, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that we want passion. We want to see that. Whereas maybe the baby boomers were like, no, 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 we've had the crazy, passionate people yelling at us before. Yeah. Just we want a, a little bit Just calmer. <laughs> and now, you know, preachers like Craig Groeschel and Stephen Furtick are so passionate, so much energy that, you know, people want to see that much energy because it's like, oh, maybe you actually believe this. I agree with what Matt's just said. I think that um, preaching is less formal in its style than it once was. Um, you know, back a hundred years ago, you know, you read sermons uh, from that era and it was very much more oratorical, you know, with rhetorical flourishes and uh, formalized. You're, you're hearing a speech uh, oftentimes, or at least it reads that way. And increasingly, I think to Matt's point, uh, it's gotten more conversational in tone, if not actually a conversation. But the way we present it is very much just like, like we're sitting across a, a table at Starbucks and I'm just telling you about Jesus or explaining something in the Bible to you. Um, and kind of there's, there's room for variance in that kind of in the, in the middle. I'm more of a performer than a converse, you know, a, just a talker, um, kind of more of a, you know, presenter. Uh, you know, you're sort of watching a presentation, but it's not, you know, I'm not giving a speech as much as I'm, you know, doing that kind of thing. So there's, there's room for variance. It's a continuum, I think, but it's overall, the trend is it's much less formal than it once was. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that just reflects the culture. You're reminding me of that rather famous quote from over a hundred years ago, I think the early 20th century by the famous, uh, preacher Phillips Brooks, who mm. called preaching truth through personality. Well, I, I, 
I'm glad you mentioned that, Don, because I think it speaks to the reality that God raises up all kinds of different people to communicate his word. And those people have different personalities and they have different styles. I mean, one of the lectures I do in our intro to homiletics class here is I talk about speaking styles and I talk about talkers and speakers and orators. And I use those from the African-American tradition as the exemplars of oratory because that came out of their history of slavery. The preacher was the guy and he was oratorical and larger than life. And in many, many African-American churches today, uh, you still have that sense of oratory. Um, that's not true in Asian or Anglo or even Hispanic churches nearly as much. But uh, Matt had mentioned Andy Stanley, and I use him as kind of an exemplar of the speaker. Speakers are clear, they're presenters, they know where they're going to start and they're going to end. And then on this side of the equation, there are talkers, people who just have the gift of gab and they can get up, but they know where they're going. And uh, I think that, you know, those are just kind of three examples of different styles that people can take on and communicate God's word really effectively. Because I think you're absolutely right. And Brooks was right. It is truth through personality. I'm curious what, what challenges or headwinds each of you see today's church facing with regard to preaching? Some of them maybe you, you probably alluded to these in your comments already, but um, what, what's the church facing that might be new or different than it was in recent generations with regard to preaching? Um, I, I personally think one of the biggest difficulties we face as preachers, especially those of us who are, are preaching regularly um, in a church, is that the frequency of attendance is down. And uh, I don't know where he got the research, but Tom Rayner had an article a couple of years ago on his Church Answers website that the average attender today is showing up 15% less than he did even five, 10 years ago. And that 15% less, like I figured it out, that means like over a span of two months, they're coming one less time. So if they were coming, you know, six times in two months, now they're coming five. And because of that, that's less touch points for that person to engage with the preaching, the teaching. So if you're trying to preach through a book consecutively, it makes it more difficult. Um, so that's the challenge. I think the benefits of nowadays that we have is, like I mentioned earlier, the podcast, that there is YouTube, that there is, they can wake up in the morning and if they've subscribed to whatever podcast app you're using, they have the message there. So, I, you know, the way we've handled it at Arise is to push Every single beginning of a sermon series, we say, hey, this sermon series is going to last four or five, six weeks. We want you to commit to this entire series, even if you're traveling. So subscribe right now before you forget, because this whole series matters. So we repeat that over and over again. And just our phrase is worship weekly, worship weekly. And we have to remind people that even if you're not here, you need to worship weekly. So the, the negative is they're not there in person. The positive is they might actually be engaging with the Bible and with what we're teaching more regularly. You know, uh, Don, it's both a, a trend and a, a current thing. When I was in college back in a prior century, I uh, attended a, a Bible teaching church for four years, and I heard two sermon series. Uh, the, the pastor preached through Exodus for two years, and he preached through Romans for two years. And he, he was a marvelous, gifted teacher, and he uh, was very thorough. And Dr. Winnig's met him and heard him teach, knows who he is. Um, but I don't know anybody who could make that work today. And uh, may maybe it didn't work back then either. It just was, he was a unique uh, animal. But, um, you know, to me, I feel like if a sermon series goes more than, I don't know, six, eight weeks to the outside, we're losing people. Uh, maybe because of what Matt said about frequency of attendance, maybe just kind of, you know, our, our attention spans are much more fragmented than they used to be. Um, but, you know, I, I, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's more difficult to keep people with you for as long as you want, even in a, um, an individual sermon or certainly a, a sermon series, uh, the longer you go. Another challenge that I think preachers today face, and they've always faced this to some degree, but I think it's even more so now. We live in a, a culture that is highly skeptical. And there's a lot of things in the Bible that seem to be off-putting to people. And those are what we call theological themes that really push hard against our humanity, like just uh, Dave and I were talking about this earlier today, maybe the judgment of God or those texts that in the Bible that deal with the judgment of God. Uh, just a lot of things in Scripture that are hard, I think, for people to hear. So I, I think that that's a challenge. I think it's 
but it's also a good opportunity for those of us who preach to deal with those hard texts. So one of the reasons, you know, we wanted Wendy to come in is because she's an expert on the book of Daniel and it's got a lot of apocalyptic stuff in there and it looks like it's not very relevant. My own feeling is it's incredibly relevant and maybe even more so in the coming years, but uh, she could probably address the, the hard text issue from her perspective. Yeah, Wendy, you're the you're the biblical scholar among yeah. us, so we need to hear from yeah. you on that. I, I'm the one of these is not like the other. I'm, I'm not preaching's not my field, so I just am listening and and um, taking in all these trends. Um, much of my church experience over the last two decades has involved jumping state lines and moving, and so I don't feel like I've had a sense of the consistency of what's going on in the pulpit because I've sat behind or in front of, I guess, so many so many pulpits. So. Um, and even crossing denominations, which just mixes it all up. So I appreciate your perspectives. Um, yeah, apocalyptic is certainly one of the more challenging sections, uh, parts of the Bible genres. Um, and yet, I I come from a background where um, Daniel and Revelation were the the primary value in those sorts of apocalyptic prophecies was being able to chart some timeline for the future and what was going to happen. And there were a couple of really terrifying movies out and, um, and, and it really turned me off to that literature, which I think is probably true for people in my generation. And I don't know how far down it goes, but um, so when I was asked to study and teach the book of Daniel, I was like, ah, that's like the one book in the old Testament I didn't want to do. Um, but as I got into it and I realized what that literature is for, um, it transformed my view of it. And so I think we come at hard literature sometimes with the wrong idea of what it's for and what its value is. And so then we struggle to preach it, to understand it. And it is hard to understand. I'll give you that. Um, but sometimes we get lost in the details that we shouldn't get lost in, and we miss the bigger picture of what the purpose of that kind of literature was. So you can preach the entire book of Daniel, and your congregation can value, can take value from it and can benefit from its message from start to finish. You know, this, this really sets us up to talk a little bit about the, the nature of preaching with, uh, with the entire canon of Scripture. Uh, and and all of all of the different genre, whether that's the poetic books, the wisdom literature, narrative books, wh- whatever, because you know it seems like we've come in uh, for, uh, over what kind of period of time I don't know, but we have come to view the word preaching or to use the word preaching in a pretty broad, flexible way of anything we're doing from a pulpit. Now, if we look at the way that word is used in the New Testament, particularly, that's uh, that's, you know, the K. Russo, the announcement, the proclamation. Preaching is proclamation. Um, and, you know, what are we proclaiming? Well, we're, we're proclaiming the gospel. We're, we're proclaiming the lordship of Christ. We're proclaiming the kingdom of God. And I wonder if that's something you'd want to reflect on, is how, how our understanding of the nature and the definition of what preaching is fits with what it means to proclaim those things from the different parts of Scripture. As, as, as opposed or maybe compared to just teaching our way through those parts of Scripture. What does it mean to actually preach or proclaim from the whole counsel of God? Um, I've, I've joked with some of the, the students I've taught over at Denver Seminary that if God in his wisdom is smart enough to give us different genres of literature, like he didn't just write us a love letter, like, yes, we have some of those, but we also have some narrative and Psalms and poetry. Like if God in his wisdom would do that, I think in the same way, uh, we should be a little smarter than just having one type of sermon that we use over and over again. Yeah. So I, I would say part of that, like there's something that happens in different genres. And I'm sure uh, Wendy would be able to explain the, the two main genres of Daniel, especially, but there's something that happens in those, like with, with narrative that stirs our emotions. When we hear stories, it we connect to it on an emotional level. Same thing with poetry. It might be even a deeper level in our souls. And whereas like, you know, the Proverbs, you know, you engage a little bit more intellectually with those things, which is great because I think Jesus taught us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So in the same way, like when we 
preach through these literature, we should be seeking to stir emotions or to stir the souls or have people think a little bit more because all of those are part of how we truly worship God. In Acts 20, Paul makes a point of saying that he has preached the whole counsel of God, you know, not, not just a slice of it. Um, and I, I think that's, and, and he says, therefore I'm innocent of the blood. You know, it's like, listen, I've told you everything. Uh, not hidden things or held, held them back. And, you know, all, you know, we believe that all scripture is God breathed and therefore is profitable. And that includes the old Testament, even though, you know, we're not under the old covenant, the way ancient Israel was, but, um, still we learn so much about the character of God, the mind of God, the actions of God, the heart of God from, you know, every, every book of the Bible. And therefore we should, uh, certainly endeavor to preach through all of them, preach the whole counsel of God. You know, if we, uh, if we have, uh, years to do it, then more, the better. But, uh, if we, even if we only have uh, a few times to do it, uh, for a guest speaker or an interim pastor or that, you know, whatever the case may be, teaching a class, whatever the case may be, um, certainly not to shy away or, or just kind of gravitate toward our, our, you know, favorite pet books or pet passages or pet uh, sermon themes, uh, I think is incumbent on us as, as leaders and, and preachers and teachers. Uh, Don, you'll probably remember this because you and I overlapped when we were in seminary back before the Noahic flood. But, uh, you know, I think back in the day, we always assumed, well, we're going to teach young preachers to do Paul's letters or James, you know, didactic literature because it's easier. And over the years, having done that, I've come to the conclusion it's not necessarily easier uh, because you, you, what they were trying to communicate uh was understandable in their culture in their day, but it's, we're 2,000 years removed. All of that to say, I think what uh, Dave and Matt have said, different genres communicate different things to different people in different ways. I mean, uh, one of the things I've always appreciated about the Gospels, especially like Matthew and Luke, is they include a lot of Jesus' teaching, much of which comes in parables. I mean, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God all the time, but but he doesn't do a word study on Basileia. He doesn't really define what he means by the kingdom. What he does is he tells stories. The kingdom of God is like this, or it's like this, or it's like this. And I, I mean, I've always loved parables because of that. And you see parables in the Old Testament as well at points. So I think genre is just, I, I, it's one of the beauties of the Bible that we want to mine. So. Well, and I think that's, that may be one of the biggest challenges that preachers face is learning how to proclaim the kingdom of God from every type of genre, proclaim the kingdom of God from anywhere in scripture. Um, that's, that's tough work. Well, uh, well, it is. I would agree with that. And this is one of the other reasons we wanted to bring Wendy in, because in my opinion, one of the main themes of the book of Daniel is the kingdom of God. God is king. This He's in charge. Indeed. So <laughs> she can address that. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's totally all over the book. I mean, from the first chapter, which sets up the themes of where you're headed, you've got God's kingdom versus Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And it's a constant, I, I say battle, but there's really no question who's going to win it in Daniel. Um, but I think part of the difficulty of genres is we, some of them, and apocalyptic is one of them, they're unfamiliar to us and to our people. Um, they weren't unfamiliar to the original audience. So much of the challenge is educating your people on what the genre is and how does it function. And okay, now let me tell you what it's doing now that you understand a little bit of how it's working. Um, and, and that's hard and it takes more time and it takes more investment. And when people are not there, they're there 15% le less of the time. It, it just adds to the challenge of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're making me think about the difference between the, the methodologies of preaching and the theology of preaching. Mm -hmm. and, and we do give a lot of attention, rightly so, to the methodologies of preaching. I was trained deeply in that. Um, but I've thought in recent years more about the theology of preaching, which is kind of what I was getting at with some of these kingdom questions, these proclamation questions. And what does it mean to learn how to preach theologically, not just preach theological doctrines, but to preach from a theological vantage point? Uh, what you know? What unique challenges does that present to us in our preaching? Whatever our methodologies are, I think when I um, first wrestled with the question, "What is God doing when I preach?" 
Uh, it really helped my prayer life because I don't always know. And um, it, it may not be what I think he's going to do or ought to do. Uh, but, you know, if as, as, a, as a preacher, you know, I should be very, you know, James 3.1, you know, let not many of you seek to become preachers. It was a big deal. Um, to my translation, sorry. Um, but, but that this is a very humbling thing. God doesn't need to use me to convey his word to his people. He doesn't. Um, he could remove me from the equation in any point and for any reason, because he's God and I'm not, but, um, you know, trying to understand, okay, okay, here's, here's this text. And I've, I've outlined this text and I've prepared this message. I've got good illustrations and I want to, you know, apply it specifically. And I'm, I've got it on paper and, and I've got it. The question is though, okay, but how is God going to use this? Is what's, what's the Holy Spirit's agenda? And there've been times, uh, where I've, I've preached a message and someone has come up to me afterwards and, and, and oh, pastor, thank you so much. Uh, that was such a wonderful message. God really used that in my life. And I, I've asked the question, okay, what did, what did you get from that? What did God tell you? And they told me something that was biblical and of God that I didn't say in the message. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. okay. You don't know how you know, to feel about that. Thanks. I, I, <laughs> well, I, I, I kind of do. And I kind of, I mean, it's like, all right, that's, that's God sort of winking at me saying, you know, um, I, I had my agenda. It would have been nice if you had been on board with where I was going, but you don't have to be. That's okay. I still got it anyway. Um, <laughs> and so it keeps me humble. It keeps me grounded. It keeps me dependent on the Lord because he, I know he has an agenda for the sermon that I'm going to give on this day to this group of people. And I, you know, I need to be as attuned with the Holy Spirit to that as I possibly can. I'd love to hear from, from any of you what you think needs to shift or maybe be rethought about the nature of preaching as we move forward into the coming years. What's going to, what's going to change? What needs to change, do you think? If anything. I'm not, I'm not up on trends in preaching. I just know what my little church does. Um, but in, in my past, uh, the Old Testament has been woefully overlooked. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And Jesus and the apostles considered it scripture, and they also considered it absolutely necessary for the message they were delivering. And that is still true. So, um, you know, when I hear New Testament sermons and I can see the Old Testament that's there, and it is never brought up. I'm like, you missed it. You missed it. Um, so I think that's so important. Um, we, the Old Testament is hard and it's big. I get it. But we miss, you, you cannot grasp the fullness of the New Testament message without it. Amen to I, that. I agree, agree with that. And I, um, I think there is a specific portion of the Old Testament that is very frequently neglected, the most neglected part in, in my circles anyway, are the minor prophets. Mm. And I, I think there's so much that the minor prophets have to say, uh, Dr. Dr. Witter, can you take this if you want and just run with that for a minute? Uh, there's so much for, you know, our culture talking about justice, talking about, you know, God's heart toward the oppressed, uh, talking about God's coming judgment, even on his own people, if they, you know, are doing wicked things. Um, I think I'd like to see more minor prophet preaching in the future. I think one of the worst trends today is that people aren't preaching the Bible and maybe that's every generation, but I have friends and I have been at events and I've heard someone preach someone else's sermon and hear it happen regularly. Um, and, and I think it's just a, a major issue. Um, and this is one of the, the saddest example. I'm not going to name any names in this, but I was preaching through, um, so a section of, uh, you know, the Kings on, on Elijah and Elisha. So I checked out someone's book, a very popular preacher. I checked out his book and I read it and I was like, Oh, I, I don't remember that was in, in the text. Um, th this is his main point for his sermon. And then he said, Oh, I borrowed this from this other famous preacher. And I went back and listened to the other famous preacher. Um, you know, two of the most famous preachers in our country. And he had the same thing. And I was like, I don't remember that in the text. Well, it was actually from the KJV, and uh, it was a mistranslation of a word, and we know now that that mistranslation 
um, was incorrect. And so like, that's why I was like, eh, it wasn't in my NIV when I studied it because that word was only in the old KJV. But yet both these preachers are preaching something that's not in the text. And because they're borrowing it, and I know now, you know, it's secondhand and thirdhand, then all the other preachers around the country are using it. Whereas I think one of the most neglected verses in the entire Bible about the theology of preaching is 1 Peter 4.11. If anyone speaks, they should speak the very words of God. You know, it's pretty simple right there. <laughs> You're going to preach, preach God's word. Um, don't preach somebody else's sermon. So I, I don't know if those, any of those guys are listening to this sermon uh, or to this podcast right now, but I would just say, just preach the Bible. Um, let God's word do the work. Mm. Hmm. Amen. What of us do you think? Trends and shifts in well, preaching that church needs to be aware of. I think technology is is here to stay, um, and it you know with with people uh, you know live streaming or you know watching from home or watching you know after the fact on on YouTube, TikTok, social media, what have you. Um, you know, I I think it's just what is. Uh, I think COVID kind of kicked us all into that direction, and. You know, I don't think there's any going back. Um, I, I think there's, you know, Matt made the point earlier. There's some good and some bad with that. Um, that you can you can get it, get your messages or parts of your messages out there in ways that they wouldn't have been before. But also, you know, it can be a temptation for people to sort of not be embodied in a live experience. They'll just say, mm-hmm. oh, "I'll just get the, you know, I'll just watch later, and I'll just, you know." And I don't, I don't think that's good. I don't, I don't think that's. Um, church as as uh, the apostle first century apostles would have uh, approved so you know but but you know sometimes we need to learn how to how do we preach into a camera how do we how do we preach knowing that there's an audience out there a potential audience out there that isn't in the room uh those are questions i think we haven't you know we we have uh, previous generations haven't had to wrestle with yeah <clears throat> i'm gonna piggyback off of something matt said just a moment ago about making sure that our sermons are biblical and centered in scripture. Uh, For my Old Testament Bible reading, I've been going through the Old Testament from Genesis on, and I'm in 2 Chronicles now, and I'm nearing the end of 2 Chronicles. And it struck me on numerous mornings as I'm reading this, going through 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. I mean, I know the monarchy was a very mixed bag for Israel. I get that. But I think what is very disturbing is these are God's people. They were given God's word, and yet they drift enormously spiritually and morally. And then it's like all of a sudden, somebody somewhere rises up and says, oh, here's here's scripture. We need to get back to this. And it's like there's a revival. And I'm thinking, why is it so easy for us to get away from scripture? And I thought, I think Matt's absolutely right. In our current cultural context, it's easy to get away from Scripture because Scripture pushes hard against us in some ways. It also shows us the love of God in deep, deep ways. We just celebrated that with the cross and the resurrection. But it seems to me when we get away from Scripture, the, the temptation to drift from God and how he wants us to live becomes ever more present. So I, I think Matt's absolutely right. We need to just preach the Bible in its fullness. Well, really appreciate that. That's uh, that, that kind of leads us right into the reason that the four of you are gathered, which is our upcoming Shannon lectureship and seminar on preaching. Um, that's what brings the, the four of you together. And Scott, you're kind of the lead convener of this. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? The Shannon lectureship was established about 35 years ago by Judge Shannon and his wife. They endowed Denver Seminary with a very generous gift in order to promote biblical preaching. Um, Over the years, what we've done is we've brought in different people to, you know, uh, hold forth in chapel. But since we started to do chapel very differently about four or five years ago, um, a couple of years ago, some friends of mine said, uh, basically, you need to revision this, redo it. And so last year we held the first Shannon lectureship with Doug Moo, and Doug came in and taught us on the book of Hebrews, and then Steve Matheson and I kind of got up and tried to process our way through how we would preach different passages out of Hebrews, and I thought that the lectureship went really well. I think everybody enjoyed it. Doug Moo was great, big hit, loved him, and I think overall it went really well. Well, this is our second Shannon seminar, and my favorite Old Testament book is Daniel, And I had come across Wendy Witter a number of years ago 
and her commentary on Daniel. And I thought, hey, you know what? I want to do Daniel this year. And if Wendy Witter will come and do Daniel with us, it's going to be fantastic. And she has very graciously agreed to come and walk us all the way through all those narratives and apocalyptic texts. And then Dave and Matt and I are going to, you know, team teach, try teach on how to uh, preach those narratives and apocalyptic texts. So we're very, very excited about the Shannon Lectureship, June 3rd through 6th. And I want to encourage everybody who watches this uh, podcast, this webinar to come. Uh, it's $150 if you're a pastor or a layperson. And if you're a student, you can sign up for it through Homiletics 690 for two semester hours of Homiletics credit, and I'll send you the syllabus. And then I'll let uh, Dave and Matt and Wendy weigh in on their roles here. Well, I think my job is to teach you the book of Daniel. Um, I, I actually have preached through it, so I could give you some ideas on that too. Great. But um, I, I have written actually two commentaries on Daniel, uh, and it is a fantastic book with a really relevant message every chapter. Um, Why would you write a second commentary? They asked get, me not to. Not get it right the first time? Okay, all right. <laughs> I know, I know. They're both for Zondervan, <laughs> and they asked me to do the second one. Like, well, I just... I'm doing this one. Isn't that plagiarism? They said, no, no, you just, you know, don't say the same thing. Like, okay. So anyway, and it's a totally different format. It's a part of their ZCOT series, Exegetical Commentary in the Old Testament, came out last fall. So it takes a different approach. Um, this looking at the nitty gritty of the language and, and how the rhetorical arguments are shaped and how that affects understanding the meaning. And um, it's just a fantastic book. And there's so much. It's so rich, so rich. That's great. Well, I want to thank all four of you, um, Wendy, Matt, Dave, Scott, really enjoyed this conversation. Looking forward to what the Lord is going to do and hopefully lots and lots of people's lives through the, the Shannon Lectureship and Seminar this summer. Um, again, Scott, again, the dates, June. They're June 3rd, 4th and 5th from 9 to 4 in the afternoon, and then Thursday, June 6th from 9 to noon. Okay. And we'll cover all 12 chapters of Daniel and do some discussion of narrative literature and apocalyptic literature. And once again, I think we're just gonna have a great time. We did last year and I'm very, very excited that Wendy's coming and we're gonna do the book of Daniel. I'm so grateful for Dave and for Matt and their help more, more than they know or think. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks to all of you. Thanks for this great conversation. Friends, we're, we're grateful that you've uh, chosen to spend a little more time with us and we hope as always that if you get a chance you'll give us a rating a review wherever it is that you happen to listen to podcasts and if you happen to have any questions or comments we would be happy to receive those we have a designated email address podcast at denverseminary.edu and as scott mentioned our general seminary website is denverseminary.edu you can get all the information you need there about the shannon lectureship and also more information about other resources that we have here at Denver Seminary, events, degree programs. Uh, you can get all of our episodes of Engage 360, including full transcripts. So friends, we're really grateful for your interest, your support, your prayers. Uh, please please keep those coming. We value you and hope that this is a, a gift and a res good, encouraging resource for you. So until next time in our next conversation, Lord bless you and keep you. Take care, friends. <laughs>